uh, our second speaker in this session that's going to give us the overall picture on what is needed in places where resources are limited. Now he has an ambition of making pre preventive care and treatment more available despite structural constraints such as poverty, inequality and social injustice. Now please welcome Dr. Vikram Patel, Professor of Global Health at Harvard Medical School and Professor at the Harvard T.H. Chan Music School, <laughs> Chan School of Public Health from the U.S. Now good morning, I know it's early morning for you, Vikram, but uh, please tell us about your work. Thanks very much. Uh, so actually, I'm going to be talking about what I think is perhaps the missed opportunity to reduce uh, the burden of mental health problems. I don't actually think uh, uh, that just providing more treatment is going to achieve that. In no, uh, no other area of medicine has treatment actually singularly contributed to reducing the incidence and burden of a health problem. It's always really relied on prevention across virtually every single health condition across history. And so what I really want to focus on is is uh, thinking about uh, what are the most promising targets for prevention in the mental health sector by focusing on the science uh, of early life development uh, and how that can translate into opportunities for prevention in all populations. So I want to start off by acknowledging that this grumpy man who many of us in, uh, in mental health have dismissed because his ideas were out of date um, was actually probably one of the most important thinkers in the field uh, of mental health because more than 100 years ago, this man, even though he looks very upset, actually demonstrated or actually made an observation um, that mental health problems that he was seeing in his adult patients in fact had their origins in childhood. Of course, this is Sigmund Freud who then went on uh, to concoct his own explanation as to why these childhood experiences were associated with mental health problems. And while it is absolutely true that this explanation has not stood uh, uh, the grounds of scientific scrutiny over the last hundred years, the fundamental observation has actually borne true. So much so that today it is no longer questioned that adversities in early childhood are profoundly associated with poor mental health and indeed poor physical health across the life course, that there is a dose response relationship between adversities. And this has been demonstrated in every single culture and context in which this question has been asked. Today, it's widely acknowledged that preventing adverse childhood experiences would prevent a very large number of mental health and other behavioral health conditions. Of course, when we think of adversities, we often think of extreme events, such as the ones shown on this particular slide, which we think might affect only a small minority of children and would not explain the population burden of mental health problems. However, in fact, we now know that the most common adversity is economic difficulties, growing up in a household that is relatively or absolutely poor. And in this regard, every country in the world has inequities in terms of income distribution or access to material resources that enable their par parents to provide nurturing environments for very young children. And you can also see a bunch of other uh, adverse childhood experiences. And I'm pretty sure uh, in Scandinavia too, you would find that these rates are actually pretty high. Of course, in developing countries, the adversities can be more extreme and can also go from not just psychosocial, but also biological, such as, for example, malnutrition and air pollution, which has been more recently shown to be a very important contributor uh, to poor child development and mental health. What's the mechanism? Uh, well, certainly it isn't the psychoanalytical mechanism that Freud postulated. Uh, we now have a very good understanding, thanks to the science of brain plasticity, which shows us that it is the early windows of experience that shape brain function. Of course, partly this is, this is constrained by a genetic endowment, but that's only a minor part of the entire explanation for adult mental health. The most important part really is how environmental influences shape brain development during two very important critical periods of development that I want to touch on. The first is in the very early years of life, the first three to five years of life, when we now know that neglect has a double whammy on the developing brain through two different mechanisms. First of all, the lack of a nurturing environment leads to missing the interaction that is so essential to build the sturdy brain architecture. Uh, and 
essentially in a very simple way, if you are not stimulated uh, by typically your parents or others in your parent and in, in your home environment, brain architecture will not develop in the way that it should. And secondly, because these environments are also associated with what's called toxic stress, stressful circumstances which activate um, uh, the stress circuits, but which from which there is no release or, or recovery. For example, when there's chronic enduring threats of marital uh, sort of parental conflict uh, or physical or emotional abuse. More recently, though, we have also recognized a second sensitive phase of early life development, and that has been really the result of the demonstration that most mental health problems begin before the age of 24, and that the peak of maximum onset of mental health problems is actually in adolescence. We often wondered why that was the case. Uh, why was adolescence such a, uh, such a unique uh, phase in the life course for the development of mental health problems? And thanks to revolutionary findings uh, from, again, neurodevelopmental science in the last two, week, uh, two, year, uh, two decades, sorry. Um, and I would recommend those of you who are trying to figure out why you're, uh, if you have an adolescent in your home, why they behave the way they do. This is a great book um, by neuroscientists that I turned to when I uh, had a, teenager's, a teenage son in my home. Uh, this this, this uh, book wonderfully summarizes the remarkable new understandings of brain development during adolescence, not least the discovery that different parts of the cerebral cortex mature at different periods of time with the limbic cortex that is responsible for what neuroscientists call our hot emotions like rage and thrill seeking maturing about six to 10 years earlier than the prefrontal cortex, um, which is associated with higher ordered executive functioning, such as decision making. And this means that young people are actually evolutionary primed to behave impulsively to seek thrills and rewards. This is actually how we make the successful transition from childhood into adulthood. And so this is an essential part of our growing up. But of course, this priming to behave impulsively and seek thrills presents unique vulnerabilities on the other hand. Those vulnerabilities are created by a variety of different aspects of social change and adversity that happen during adolescence. Of course, dramatic life transitions are the most important, and this is part of growing up in all societies where one moves from being a completely dependent uh, individual, dependent on one's parents for all one's needs, to becoming completely autonomous and independent in a very short period of only six to 10 years of our life course. During these years, we are especially vulnerable to being exposed to bullying, violence, sexual harassment from our peers, discrimination, particularly, for example, sexual minorities or also minority groups more generally, and a variety of oppressive social, cultural, and economic circumstances. And it is when one or more of these coincide and collide with this developmental stage that mental health problems are likely to emerge. In other words, if we want to reduce the burden of mental health problems, we need to begin by scaling up what we know works in terms of targeting harmful environments during the early life course. And to do that, we have to recognize that those environments change according to how old one is. So, for example, at in very young children, the primary environment is the home environment. As children go to school, school environments and peer environments become increasingly common. And by that, I would include the digital environment, of course, uh, uh, especially in the last decade, uh, which has transformed our understanding of environmental influences on the mental health of young people. And of course, neighborhoods and broader societal environments become relevant also as one goes into young adulthood. In the Disease Control Priorities Program, which I led for the World Bank, uh, we identified a number of, of evidence-based interventions that could target these harmful environments at home, parenting interventions to promote early child development in educational institutions, teaching life skills related to emotional regulation and problem solving, promoting a healthy environment in school and college uh, uh, settings, and providing access to low intensity mental health care within these educational institutions. And of course, at a societal level, a number of very, very exciting uh, interventions that could be implemented now, such as cash transfers for low-income families and challenging discrimination against minority groups. 
I want to end by just giving examples of some of my own ongoing work in India and other developing countries that illustrate how these interventions can be scaled up even in the least resourced parts of the world. Three examples, really. The first is how one can scale up parenting interventions for early child development, probably the most evidence-based early life intervention for the prevention of mental health problems across the life course, but of course, through the pathway of promoting cognitive development and therefore educational attainment uh, in young children. Here you can see the theory of change of the active ingredients of the interventions uh, shown in the figure on the right-hand side. And through the EMPOWER initiative that we have launched at Harvard Medical School in partnership with many institutions in the developing world, we are now creating a digital platform for the training of frontline workers so that they can learn these evidence-based interventions and be offered support and supervision for quality assurance for their delivery. The second kind of intervention is transforming school environments. And over the last many years, I have been working closely with school systems in India um, to examine what aspects of the school environment uh, can actually be modified. And very importantly, how can we engage the agency of children and adolescents to actually be actors, indeed leaders, in transforming the school environment? Such an intervention that focused on the school environment was evaluated in a one of the largest randomized control trials in the poor state of Bihar in India. And we published the findings on the Lancet on the left-hand side and the follow-up two-year findings in, the, in PLOS Medicine demonstrating the large impacts of this intervention that wasn't targeting individuals uh, or, or providing CBT skills for individuals, but instead targeting the school environment through leadership of students and, and observing large reductions in, uh, in, in, in mental health uh, um, uh, distress scores uh, in those schools in which the intervention was delivered by a lay counselor. And finally, within these same school settings, we developed a suite of interventions for those individuals who, were who had distress, you know, adopting the dimensional model. Um, these are individuals who may not necessarily meet clinical threshold criteria, but have distress and would uh, benefit from, from, from problem-solving interventions evaluating how a single classroom-based intervention could in increase not just mental health literacy, but demand for, for, uh, uh, for, for these school counseling interventions by a lay counselor, demonstrating how this lay counselor brief intervention based on problem solving just between two to four sessions could provide significant reductions in both mental health severity, but more importantly, youth-defined problem severity, just last month, we published the 12-month outcomes of the same trial, demonstrating sustained effects of this very brief low-cost intervention in schools. And more recently, we have adapted the intervention so that it can be delivered to all students uh, uh, through an app-based uh, uh, delivery in school settings. In closing, then, I think what we really do need to do is to embrace developmental science combined with the opportunities for scalable preventive interventions that are using low-cost community-based resources and brief interventions in the following ways. First of all, we need a life course approach from conception through to young adulthood if we are genuinely going to make an impact on reducing the burden of mental health problems. Secondly, this must be an equity-focused approach because we know through a large body of evidence that the disadvantages that associated with poor mental health are disproportionately distributed in the population. We need diverse community-based platforms for the delivery of interventions targeting these determinants, but I'd like to also add, including interventions that are focused on early intervention for young people who are developing the early signs of psychological distress, and again, embracing the dimensional model. We need a convergence of diverse disciplinary approaches and perspective, which has been one of the most exciting things about my work as I work with pediatricians, to child development experts, those who are focused on neuroscience of development across the early life course, and so on and so forth. And But most important of all, we need to embrace the importance of youth engagement and leadership at all levels of actions, because of course, these are all actions that are targeting children and young people. And as the old slogan uh, goes for uh, mental health, and I'd apply that for young people, nothing about us without us. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you.
Um, thank you so much, Vikram. Very, very interesting. Uh, I, I have a teenage daughter at home, so I should get that book, I think, maybe. Now, now the early um, intervention that you talk about, how do we spread this information? Uh, you did a, a fantastic job in the schools. Is that something in India? Is that something that can be transferred to other countries? And how do we reach the parents? You had a few um, good pointers there, but can you say something more about how can we reach the parents and can this school project that you did, can that be transferred? to other countries? Well, I don't see any reason why it can't be transferred. Uh, you know, obviously the, the context will be very different and therefore the kind of determinants that operate in school environments will be very different. But let me tell you, disadvantages operate in all parts of the world. I can't speak for Sweden, but the US where I'm currently based has one of the highest rates of unwanted sexual uh, advances uh, ex uh, described by college students. And I'm talking about college students at universities like mine uh, in, in Boston, um, where upwards of... 10 to 20 percent of young women describe being sexually abused by their peers. So to be honest, I think environmental factors operate across the life course. The key thing to remember is that much of the prevention work has focused on teaching young people CBT skills, and that has had a very small effect on prevention. I think we need to recognize that the problems that lead to mental health difficulties are not just in the way we cope with the world around us, but in the poisonous influences in the world around us. And if we're genuinely going to attraction on reducing mental health problems, we need to be very frank that those actions are going to lie outside the narrowly defined mental health sector. And for those of us who work in public mental health, we have to embrace, therefore, these other sectors and the many other kinds of groups of people and disciplines uh, that target those environments. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Earlier on um, today, we talked about social media and, and teenagers or adolescents. Uh, what, what's your view on social media to, to use as a tool? to get information out and I think social media can be very helpful. I mean, you know, I, uh, to be honest, uh, there's a lot of mixed uh, messaging around social media. And mo most recently, I'm sure everyone's been following the uh, disclosure by the whistleblower from Facebook about how uh, Facebook knew for a long time that its social media algorithms were driving young women uh, towards more disordered behaviors to do with their eating, for example. So I think so social media is by no means the savior. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think uh, there is evidence that social media by and of itself is bad for your mental health. I think the evidence is much more ambivalent, it's equivocal, and it uh, turns out that a lot of this has to do with how people use social media, uh, and indeed how social media algorithms use vulnerable vulnerabilities um, and, and make things worse. And I think therefore we need, first of all, to think of social media both as an opportunity and a threat, um, and figure out ways societally, because social media isn't gonna reform itself as long as there's a profit motive, um, uh, how we can actually make sure that social media does more good than harm to young people's mental health. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. And